I'm Shanti Kalatal, Senior Director of the International Forum for Democratic Studies at the National Endowment for Democracy. And I'll be hosting the discussion and Q&A portion of the evening, which we expect to run roughly until 9.15. For registered participants, please use the Q&A function on the right-hand side of your screen. And for those watching the live stream, you can submit questions to forum at ned.org. I also invite you to check out the Lipset Lecture page on the NED website, where you can find four, more of Seymour Martin Lipset's work. So, Minxin, first of all, let me just say it's such a pleasure to host this discussion with you. We were colleagues many years ago, and I've had the benefit of talking with you about China's trajectory for a long time. So I wanted to kick off this portion um, with a question about how your views have evolved since the publication of your first book, From Reform to Revolution, over 20 years ago. Can you talk about what's led your thinking to evolve? And can you point to perhaps two or three catalyzing events that have shaped your views? Yeah. Thank you, Shanti. It's so good to see you. And thank you for moderating today's discussion. Uh, well, I began as a true believer in the power of economic reform to change, to, uh, to lead to political change. Uh, and today I still believe, but except I think it's a much more complex process. The events that changed my uh, thinking uh, were those really from personal experience. Starting in the late 1990s, I began to uh, observe that China's political reform started to slow down. Uh, and then in the early 2000s, when I was working at the Carnegie Endowment, I began to conduct a series of exchange programs with the Chinese Central Party School, which is one of the most prestigious and influential institutions devoted to educating senior and mid-ranking Chinese officials. And in those interactions, what I found was that the party really had no interest in starting any significant or meaningful political reforms. Uh, and that led to uh, my uh, second book, which is China's Trapped Transition. So that was just a, uh, that marked a very important stage in my thinking about China, because I thought if economic reform, and by that time, by the early 2000s, China entered the WTO, its economic growth was accelerating. If that kind of political change would not lead the party to adopt even very modest political changes, what's behind this phenomenon? So I, uh, decided that the party actually had very uh, understandable incentives uh, to keep the status quo. So when uh, Xi Jinping came, uh, became the party secretary, initially we all maintained an open mind. We saw that uh, this could mark a turning point in China's uh, change. But the leak of his uh, speech, which I quoted, at some length in my uh, lecture, uh, that was in early 2013, uh, began to worry me because uh, what he showed was not any interest, was not some interest in political reform, but a strong determination, not only to maintain the status quo, but to harden China's authoritarian rule. And the developments since then have only confirmed the worries I and my colleagues have had, have had about China's future. But ironically, because what has happened, uh, because of the pushback against this uh, form of neo-Stalinism, uh, especially from the West, uh, I have now become a bit more optimistic because uh, what can uh, really uh, keep China's trapped transition stagnant for a long, long time is actually form of conservative new authoritarianism that uh, maintains the status quo and does not rock the boat with the West. But of course, today, the situation has completely changed. Great. Well, thank you for that. Um, and let me follow up on that by asking you to discuss a little bit um, what you've described as China's current neo-Stalinist moment and saying that it may not be permanent. But I'd like you to consider the other side of that coin. In other words, what, in your view, would be more likely to entrench this moment 
and make the trends that we're seeing right now more likely to endure for the longer term. Yeah, well, there are still quite a few unknowns in how uh, the developments in the next, uh, next 10, 15 years will pan out. Uh, I'm not saying that the chances of success for this new Stalinist experiment will be zero. Uh, there are uh, what has real possibilities they might succeed, which will be truly frightening. Let me just single out some of the uh, developments that might work in favor of the Chinese uh, Communist Party. The first is really economic development. Uh, China today possesses enormous economic heft. It counts, depending on how you, uh, kick, uh, what measures you use, uh, uh, 15 billion, uh, trillion dollars uh, in terms of economic output. Uh, Second largest economy in the world, its technological progress is much faster than a lot of us would expect in the future. Uh, and it has a very dynamic uh, private sector despite the commanding heights being controlled by the state-owned entities. Uh, so if under one party rule, uh, with some modest marginal economic reforms, the party can sustain its economic growth, they add close to 5%, that could change the situation, that could change our forecast about likely scenarios uh, dramatically. The second is uh, what we might call techno surveillance state. The party is investing, as I said in my lecture, just an unbelievable amount of money in beefing up its surveillance and repressive capability. We really don't know how effective this is going to be. My optimistic assumption is that surveillance capabilities alone cannot save a truly decaying regime. The Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, uh, well, in the Soviet Union, the former Eastern uh, and Eastern Europe, communism did not collapse because its surveillance capabilities deteriorated or atrophied. The regimes in those parts of the world experienced an existential crisis. The ruling elites lost the will to fight, as Xi Jinping himself correctly identified. But suppose uh, the rule of fear is truly effective, and it can preempt any form of resistance and popular mobilization. Then it's a very, very scary uh, uh, prospect. So I would just identify these two uh, for uh, for now. Uh, of course, there are. Uh, others, uh, other possibilities, uh, uh, we, we may be able to talk about them later on uh, in the discussion. Sure, of course. And let me just follow up on that um, with one more question, and then we can turn to some of the audience questions and comments. But I wanted to ask you to think about the implications of the dynamics that you've described for China's role in the world. You focused largely in your talk on China, China's domestic political landscape. But if we look at this um, from China's projection of power outward beyond its borders, um, how would you see that this has changed? How have the dynamics you've described affected this? And has there been a difference before and after the rise of Xi Jinping? Yeah, before the rise of Xi Jinping, we could already see tentative, probing, and optimist, opportunistic movement. Uh, by China to expand its influence abroad. After Xi Jinping's rise, there was a much more concerted, comprehensive, strategic, and well-resourced effort to exp expand China's uh, footprint around the world, both in geopolitical, ideological, and economic uh, areas. Uh, but this in retrospect, is an untimely, premature, and too ambitious and costly overreach. So looking ahead, I would say the Chinese Communist Party may likely increase its odds of survival through a strategic program of overseas retrenchment, curtailing many of these uh, premature and costly initiatives. It may suffer a short-term uh, 
strategic setback, its influence will decline, but it can re uh, conserve precious resources for the long haul. Uh, but we don't know when that's going to happen because uh, many of these initiatives were associated with Xi Jinping personally, and it is really hard to reverse these initiatives because doing so would indirectly implicate Xi Jinping and raise doubts about the political wisdom of these first these foreign policy initiatives in the first place. Why don't we go now to a couple of questions from the audience. Um, I'll bundle a couple of these together because they have to do with comparisons between um, China and the former Soviet Union. So one says, you pointed out that she studied the Gorbachev period, but what you described tonight sounds more like the Brezhnev era. Is the CCP studying that period? Would some of their analysts agree with your lecture tonight? And a related one asks, Andy Walder argued that Deng was a accomplished radical economic reform compared to Gorbachev because the Cultural Revolution had destroyed the CCP while the CPSU largely survived. Yet you are arguing that the CCP's totalitarian structure survived. How do you account for this? Okay, uh, those are excellent questions. Uh, the CCP actually, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, under the leadership of Jiang Zemin, who was uh, the party secretary at that time, undertook a long and serious effort to study why the Soviet Union collapsed. And there were two competing schools of thought. One school argued that it was the Brezhnev period, the stagnation in particular, and uh, the, uh, the strategic conflict with the US that paved the way for the Soviet collapse. So the lesson to be drawn from that conclusion was that China needed to reform. China should not ever engage in a strategic conflict with the US. But there was another school of thought that completely overlooked the Brezhnev period, but instead focused on the Gorbachev reforms. And that school concluded that there should never be a Gorbachev in the former Soviet Union. Gorbachev's reforms undermined one party rule and ushered in the Soviet collapse. As far as, uh, as, we, can, as, far as we can, uh, can tell, just on the basis of Xi Jinping's speech, he apparently uh, is convinced by the second school of thought. Uh, so as uh, for the second question, uh, when you look at the uh, sort of the destruction of the cultural revolution on the Chinese party state, there was no question that the cultural revolution inflicted tremendous amount of damage on the party state. But those damage was largely in, hu in terms of human toll. A hundred million people were persecuted. Roughly a third of the uh, Central Committee were imprisoned. Some of the most senior leaders committed suicide or were murdered during the Cultural Revolution. But if you measure the Chinese party state in organizational terms, one has to say that as an organization, the party state was largely preserved. And it could be fun it could be mobilized in the post Mao period to engage in rapid economic growth. So uh, the devastation created the political incentive for economic reform, but the devastation did not really fundamentally destroy the political and organizational foundation of one party rule. We have a couple of questions from the audience on what you see as the role of nationalism in shoring up support for the CCP. Yes, uh, this uh, actually uh, should, be one, uh, should be one of the factors, uncertainty factors. Uh, it's, a, it's a question that a lot of people in the West should think about. I think one of the unforeseen success stories of the post Tiananmen era uh, as far as the Communist Party was concerned, was the revival of Chinese nationalism. 
which is an asset for the Chinese Communist Party. And when you look at uh, just the extent, the reach, and the depth of Chinese nationalism, it is uh, very difficult not to imagine that the party will continue to tap into Chinese nationalism as a very valuable resource of support. So the question is, uh, going forward is 10, 15 years, can Chinese nationalism sustain one party rule in a very adverse environment? In the last 30 years, Chinese nationalism became very pro-regime for the most part because of the success of the Chinese, the economic success of the Chinese Communist Party. So in the next 10, 15 years, if the Chinese economic situation deteriorates, the question is whether we will see that Chinese nationalism will be less supportive of the Chinese Communist Party. So this is the first uncertainty. The second uncertainty is what can materially uh, Chinese nationalism do in terms of supporting the Communist Party? Will Chinese nationalism be translated into personal sacrifice so that the Communist Party can invest more in surveillance, can invest more in its military capabilities, can invest more in sustaining state-owned companies? Nobody knows. My answer is probably not. Can Chinese nationalism spur China's efforts to achieve technological self-sufficiency? It is also a big question mark. So there are many, many questions associated with the practical effects, political or economic, about Chinese nationalism. Even though there is very little doubt that Chinese nationalism remains a huge asset for the Chinese Communist Party. So we have several questions that all relate to technology, um, one of which, or maybe a group of which, are asking about the implications of the social credit system or social credit systems that the party is trying to implement at the moment and the implications of this for China's chances of democratization. And another question asks whether there's a danger that big data and the algorithms of repression might succeed in creating a fundamentally new kind of citizen who has no desire for democracy or political change. So perhaps you could react to that. Uh, yes, well, uh, first one is that uh, we really don't know how successful this effort to create an Orwellian techno surveillance state uh, will be. Uh, my uh, answer is that it will be partly successful because uh, modern technology can do a lot of uh, things that will be very, very helpful to any political authority. And in the case of China, uh, it, uh, the government has already demonstrated a very impressive record of deploying such technologies. Uh, so even if in terms of its technological capabilities, such a surveillance state is partly successful, it can add tremendous repressive capabilities to the Chinese system. This said, as I uh, briefly alluded to earlier, I still doubt that a highly capable, in technological terms, a highly capable repressive state will maintain power if its economy is in deep trouble, if its ruling elites are completely demoralized, and if most of society uh, wakes up to understand that the conditions are completely intolerable. East Germany fell, let's just go back to 1989. In November 1989, I don't think the East German police, as I said earlier, uh, was incapable in any technological terms. The East German surveillance state, its informers network, were just as good as it had always been. But it is the change in psychology. It is a change in the political recognition that the current system has come to its end. 
That is the most fundamental uh, uh, point to make. And I, so on this, I would say that uh, the Chinese government can try, can invest resources, but the end of, at the end of the day, uh, the contribution to maintaining one party system by technology will be real, but will eventually be marginal. So uh, the second is that whether brainwashing, whether the surveillance state will somehow change the Chinese people into a special species with no democratic desires. I actually, uh, I believe this is not going to happen. All we need to do is to look at a coronavirus crisis. For one brief mom moment, this is in early February this year. If you look at just one incident, this is the death of Dr. Li Wenliang with an eye doctor infected by the coronavirus and later died. Uh, he was the one of the first doctors to uh, sound a warning about the infectiousness of the virus. And he was uh, harassed, intimidated by the Chinese police. And when, when he died, you could see this explosion on Chinese social media, even in some official publications of anger at the government. And amazingly, for about two weeks, the government didn't do anything about this explosion of anger and public protest. So just uh, this is just one data point, and there, there are other data points, such as uh, the high number of social protests continuing in China today. So human beings in, uh, share similar interests, similar values in protecting their interests, in protecting their security, and in some form of justice. I don't think technological surveillance and ideological indoctrination will turn the entire Chinese nation into a people with no belief in such universal values. So let me pick up on your point about the pandemic. We actually have a question related to that. The pandemic has revealed great inequities within Chinese society. For instance, migrant workers were abandoned by their government during lockdowns, and the lowest socioeconomic sections of Chinese society have in fact suffered the greatest financial strain. Do you feel the plight of these populations poses an issue to the CCP? I, uh, I think the plight of the so-called the new Chinese underclass, mostly migrant workers, uh, or people in the informal sector, or people who live on the margins, uh, they do not pose an existential threat to the rule of the Chinese Communist Party. What threatens the longevity of this system is actually internal power struggle within the Communist Party elites and the China's and China's middle class, uh, because these are the groups that have the capacity to mobilize, the capacity to organize collective action, and they are closest to the center of the power of the Chinese government. So when you look at how, uh, what the Chinese government actually is spending money on, it is spending money monitoring its own elites, monitoring the Chinese middle class, monitoring Chinese cities. The first surveillance state, the China, uh, the first technological surveillance state is being established in Chinese cities, not the Chinese countryside. Let me go to a couple of related questions that touch upon a subject that you've written extensively about before, which is the issue of corruption. So perhaps you could comment on um, the implications of corruption for the CCP. Is it a threat to the CCP? And uh, what do you see as some of the obstacles to clean up the banking sector in particular, or that might force banking sector reform to take place? Yeah, well, the uh, corruption before Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaign uh, was a very serious threat to the CCP because it generated a, dynam uh, a dynamic of bad money driving out good money. That is, corrupt officials could get ahead with bribes to the superiors, with connections with 
private businessmen, uh, and gradually these groups will uh, engage in large-scale theft of state assets, and uh, they will also lose ideological commitment to the Communist Party. After Xi's anti-corruption campaign, the corruption landscape has changed very dramatically. If we can say that before uh, Xi Jinping's rise, uh, corruption in China was decentralized, within the regime, now it is no longer centralized. That is, only those connected with the power center can engage in corruption. So corruption poses a very different threat to the regime that is now it is likely to engender resentment among different factions within the Communist Party. Those favored by the top leadership will continue to enjoy all the access to economic rents and privileges, while those out of favor will no longer have the same level of access. And instead, they have to live in constant fear of being accused of being corrupt. So this, now corruption today, is a driver for internal division within Communist Party. So uh, I forgot the other uh, question. So can you just repeat the other question about uh, uh, the second one? Yes, yeah. the, the second one was just related to reform of the state banking sector and what you think some of the obstacles to that might be. This lies outside my specialty because I'm not an economist. Based on what I've been reading in the Chinese financial press, uh, the state banking sector has very serious corruption problems. The, uh, one of the banks that has just been found to be insolvent has more than $20 billion in lost uh, loans, in loans that cannot be replay, uh, repaid. And they've arrested a lot of uh, officials connected with that bank. It's called Baosan Bank. Uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg. So as uh, China tries to clean up its banking sector, we're going to see a lot more similar instances. Uh, I think if the Chinese government wants to ensure its economic viability in the coming decade and a half, cleaning up the banking sector is critical to its success. But how it can do so is really problematic because the party does not want to lose control of the banking sector. Once it loses control of the banking sector, then it will lose the control of a commanding height, one of the commanding uh, uh, heights of the Chinese economy. Uh, but if it retains control and similar cases of corruption, inefficiency will uh, not be prevented in the future. Let me turn to the, um, the foreign policy side of things, and I'll ask a question that's come in that I think is being asked a lot these days. To what extent do you believe ideology plays a role in U.S.-China strategic competition? It's a, it's a terrific question. I think it's just one of the three factors. It is a contributing factor, uh, but also an important one. I would say this balance of power shift in favor of China in the last 20 years was a decisive factor. That is, uh, if you look at the Chinese economy, the size of the Chinese economy between 2000 and today, the shift is very dramatic. In 2000, the Chinese economy was about 13% of the U.S. economy measured in dollar terms. Today, it's two thirds, it's 67%. And that precipitate a lot of policy changes in Beijing. The second, obviously, is ideological uh, conflict. But uh, the ideological conflict did not start in the pre-Xi Jinping era. The Chinese Communist Party was conservative, but not neo-Stalinist. The ideological conflict became far more pronounced only in the last eight years. And the third factor was policy. And we also, as I 
alluded to in my lecture, we saw a fundamental reversal of many of the conservative policies, pragmatic policies, that dominated China's post Tiananmen era, which I would say is from 1992 to 2012, the year of Xi Jinping's rise. So the combination of the shift in balance of power, ideological differences, and emergence of new policies, all these factors combined to precipitate this really rapid and fundamental downturn in U.S.-China relations and China's relations with the outside world. In terms of research, it is very, very difficult to disentangle these factors from uh, uh, one by one from the other. And another question uh, in the foreign policy sphere. What do you think is the best way for democratic nations to react to China's increasing efforts to divide democracies, weaken the democratic model, and threaten other nations using, for instance, eco economic coercion and other measures? Uh, I would propose three broad suggestions. The first time foremost, is that democracies around the world first need to strengthen themselves. China, the most valuable asset for China today is the deterioration of democratic institutions and values and democratic backsliding in new democracies and most worryingly in some of the most well-established democracies such as the U.S. So this is the first one. The second one is that democracies must form alliances. Democracies must obey, must adhere to rule-based international order. That is, if democracies start to fight tariff wars against each other, if democracies start to charge each other for security commitments, then these democracies will be easy picks for China. And third is that these democracies must uh, work together to offer developing countries, where I have to point out that China's model still holds a great deal of appeal, to help them to develop their economies, to strengthen their state capacity, and to cultivate democratic values. Uh, if these three strategies or policies are adopted, uh, I'm very confident that China's efforts to divide and infiltrate democracies will be largely unsuccessful. Well, while we could continue this discussion for quite a while, unfortunately, we've come to the evening's close. So thank you very much, Minxing, and I'd like to turn it over again to Chris Walker, Vice President of Studies and Analysis at the National Endowment for Democracy. What a great conversation we've just heard between this year's Lipset lecturer, Minxin Pei, and my colleague, Shanti Kalafil. And I'm going to take this opportunity first to thank Shanti for conducting such a terrific and rich conversation with Minxin Pei. And I'd also like to thank my other colleagues at the NED for their excellent work in the production of this event. It's also um, my pleasure to recognize our Canadian partners whose cooperation we value so much and their participation in this effort is so integral to the lecture's success. This one was no exception. And of course, I'd like to express my particular thanks to our 2020 lecturer, Minxin Pei, who's provided us with such an important and thought-provoking lecture on what is indisputably a top-order subject and challenge. And finally, I'd like to thank all of you and our audience for taking the time and giving your attention for this discussion, and I'm hopeful that we'll see you next year uh, for the lecture we organized then. Thank you to everyone.